Thank you for joining us at Aletheia Bible Fellowship. Today we take another look at adoption through the example of David in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Um, hopefully this uh, is something that uh, will help you grow and understand uh, what adoption looks like uh, through the lens of your Christian life. If you have more questions or would like to contact us, uh, you can reach us through our website at abfpdx.org. All right, so once again, we uh, come to you um, live, but also recorded, depending on when you're hearing this message. Um, it was kind of a, an interesting week uh, for many of us. Uh, there's one thing, I know I talked last week about how I had this idea of emancipation running through my brain, as I'm supposed to be talking about adoption this week. Uh, but uh, today in particular, uh, it was kind of a, I don't know, kind of a weird thing for me. E everywhere I looked, there was this idea of building that came up. Uh, just for a few examples, uh, it, for Firesmiths, as part of our reading plan, uh, we're reading uh, in 1 Corinthians right now. And today we read in 1 Corinthians 3 about our foundation and what we build on that foundation being tested by fire. Um, I also read um, the verse of the day from my Bible app, which was in Psalms 139, and I decided to read that obviously in context and not just the, uh, not just the single verse. And as I read through the context of it, it talks of God's workmanship as he built us and knit us together in our parents' womb. And then an additional Bible study that I'm doing with a few of the members here, uh, we read in Isaiah about the need to add an addition to our household as our houses will be bursting at the seams. So everywhere I look was this idea of building, building, building. Uh, so with that in mind, everything that I had built for the sermon, I kind of threw out, which is a scary thing to do at... 6.30 in the morning of the day that you're supposed to preach the sermon. But these things definitely remained, even with these last-minute changes, there was this concept of building in regards to our adoption. If you remember last week, we talked specifically, like I said, about emancipation. So we gave a little bit of history lesson of the Emancipation Proclamation. We talked about the idea of adoption through the Roman legal process, uh, we talked about a few Latin words and learned where we even get uh, the concept of emancipation. Um, we talked about the power of the family, the power of the father throughout the family. Um, with our history lesson, we you know, talked about the fact that we have to break off and, and literally die to our old life, which should bring to mind... Uh, you know, terms of like baptism, for example. Uh, but we, in this process of being adopted into God's family, we lose everything that we considered to be our rights from our previous life. Um, the experiences that we had and the, the person that we became, because we are known by our Father in the legal sense, ceases to be of importance to us. I mean, in, in the, the Roman terms that we were talking about, even debts were canceled. Um, that's pretty cool. Don't have to carry those over anymore. Um, so there's this idea that this whole support that had been built, the way that we had learned to act, the, the way it is that we responded to stimulus, they all just kind of change as we take opportunity now to relearn who we are in this new person, this new identity, in this new legacy of being under the, the power of uh, God through Christ and being adopted children in that way. This was really setting up for an understanding of the doctrine of adoption, because I think it's important that you have a little bit of an understanding of the doctrine of adoption and how it applies to our lives and who we are in regards to that, but we need to go further than just a brief lesson in doctrine or even just a cursory understanding of the doctrine. This, is, uh, this idea, this concept of adoption has to permeate 
our lives and flow through us so that it's not just us who are adopted, but it's us who are doing the adoption as well. So we, as we look at adoption as sons and daughters of God, we're given examples, right, um, of how it is that we're to live our lives. We have the, the Word of God. I listed off a couple of examples from the Old Testament. You remember I talked about Moses and how God worked the circumstances just right so that Moses was able to be educated in the finest schools at the time to become part of the leadership structure of the country that he was a slave in so that eventually he would have a more powerful voice within that system through God's deliverance be able to bring people out of Egypt. Uh, We talked... um, about uh, a few other instances, but one that I mentioned briefly and didn't talk too much about was the idea of King David. So today, I want to use this, uh, this part to expand a little bit further into what our role is, because I think David here exhibits the kind of attitude that we should be taking towards other people as well, knowing that we are adopted in the family of God. Uh, This is actually quite a notable story of adoption. It's found in 2 Samuel in the ninth chapter. And uh, it's uh, it's only, what, 12 verses here? Uh, So we'll go ahead and read through all of them, and then we'll discuss things a little bit here. So uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Uh, David asks, uh, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of Saul's house named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there anyone still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And Ziba answered the king, there is the son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. And Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Emil, in Lodavar. So King David brought him from Lodavar, from the house of Machir, son of Emil. And when Mephizabesh, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, This is where I have to say this name over and over again. Mephibosheth. I'll go with that one. Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied, Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you all the land that belongs to your grandfather Saul, and and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belongs to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him, bring in the crops, so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever the Lord king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Turn me down on these speakers a little bit. That's great. All right. So we see a few things that we should take note of. First of all, I have problems saying Mephibosheth. But David, David here in this example, took initiative. He sought out specifically any remaining sons of Saul. Notice he wasn't selective. He didn't say specifically is there anyone left from Jonathan's line? He said, any remaining sons of Saul. Secondly, David showed mercy to one who is unworthy, a descendant of his enemy. Thirdly, he sought 
one who was considered a social outcast, socially rejected and even despised. Normally a king wouldn't even want someone in Mephibosheth's condition to be in front of him. There's a reason that it's stated twice in that passage that he was lame, that his feet were broken. In fact, the name Mephibosheth literally means uh, a shameful one. So this, this isn't the only time that you see this name. He's not the only one named Mephibosheth. But he has lived with this name for his whole life. He lived in a place called Lodavar, which in Hebrew means a place with no pasture. Now, if you understand the economics of the time, if you understand the economics of the time, right, the Israelites were primarily shepherds. The main economy worked off of the number of flock that you have. So a place that has no pasture, Lodvar, is worthless. It's nowhere. It's not a place that anybody seeks to be. It's a place where people are literally discarded. This is a wasteland. And then the fourth thing we see is that David was motivated by the love that he had for Jonathan, right? David was driven for his love for Jonathan, the son of the man who hunted him down, chased him all over, and David did not act as, you know, a conventional king normally would. Normally when a king comes on the scene, he immediately destroys all of his predecessor's legacy. So he will go through, and any descendant of the king that was before will be killed. Because you can't have a rival. And in David's case, uh, this would seem to be you know, particularly something that you know, he would need to do. Uh, in fact, after Saul was killed and David was raised as king, there was one of Saul's son. Ishabeth, who was raised as king as well, as a rival to David. And it was after several years of battle that David finally became victorious and became the king of all of Israel instead of part of Israel. So the idea that as king he would now make sure that the legacy of Saul is completely wiped out makes sense in that type of context. Um, if, we, if we were to you know, live in that era where we have kings and we have these types of kingdoms still in place, we would understand that to be a normal practice. So here we have David, the king, not seeking to destroy the legacy of Saul completely, even though the son of Saul had already set himself up against him previously, but to seek out anyone who is left in Saul's legacy, not to wipe him out, but to bring him to his own table, to restore to him everything that was there beforehand, and to include him in his household as one of his own son. It, it's like inviting your enemy in. Mephibosheth is given a new life. He's given uh, a peace. He's given a new purpose in life. He's given an inheritance. He's provided for, and he's given an honored position. Now the Bible goes out of our way, out of its way here to describe the condition that Mephibosheth found himself into. You know, the reason that he was nursemaid ran in fear because Saul had fallen in battle. And in the process of fleeing to try to preserve this child's life, she dropped him, crippling him in the process. Now, if you take this example that we see, it's pretty easy, 
it'd be pretty easy for you to just take a look at it and clearly see the resemblance of how our adoption takes place. You can put yourself in, pardon, it, pardon me, but Mephibosheth's shoes. You can see that God has taken us, the shameful ones, the lame ones, graciously brought us into his palace and seated us at his table, the king's table, and given us an inheritance that we are technically unworthy of. Now, primarily, this history lesson shows us how it is that we're to act towards one another, though. Uh, last week, I talked about the patria potestas, the power of the Father in regards to adoption. And it speaks to the doctrine of adoption and who we are in Christ, and it speaks to our inheritance coming through the Father and the Father being in charge of our life. This here, though, goes beyond just doctrine and shows what the practice of adoption looks like for us. David, though not a Christian, was a man after God's own heart. We, as well, can take a cue from this and see how it is that people should love and show kindness to others. This speaks to what it is that we do with the knowledge of the inheritance that it is that we receive. The inheritance that we receive gives us hope in our struggles. It gives us something to look forward to. It helps us on our path as we struggle through and patiently endure the process that we're going through here. We take notice of what our family is now, as opposed to what it was. We stop thinking of our family unit as just those that are intertwined by blood and lineage. The family tree on, you know, what, uh, my heritage or ancestry or that type of thing ceases to be of more concern for us than the people that are part of our Christian walk. Our walk, once we have accepted who Jesus is and taken the grace that God has given. We now take hold of the legacy of our new lives in Christ, and we stop thinking about families as a separate entity from the church body. So it's no longer, I have my family here, I go to church here. Those aren't two separate things, two separate events. We are all part of the family of God, first and foremost. Your family should not be a separate part of that. It should be on Sunday, I visit my church family, and during the rest of the week, I spend time with my family. Now, for David, he could have just given Mephibosheth the land and been done with him, right? Here, let me restore your inheritance, restore the legacy from your grandfather uh, through to you. But instead of just restoring, he goes further and insists on giving him a home in the palace, a seat at his table. Mephibosheth will eat at my table like one of the king's sons. This is where we see the adoption. This is where we see the privilege. And this is how we should be with each other. We are not alone in our process once we've been emancipated, emancipado from our family. We're not left alone so that we can't figure out how it is that we're supposed to survive, what it is that we're supposed to do, how our new lives are supposed to look. We have salvation and are in the process of sanctification, and in order to accomplish the growth that is needed and not fall back into old patterns and old habits and those things that, though they were uncomfortable, brought comfort we have to surround ourselves with people that will help us on that journey. Work together and cohesively as a family of adoptees. We must not just say that we're children of God and have nothing to do with one another, but actually act like you and I are 
children of God. If we're all children of God, that makes us brothers and sisters. And not just in words, but actually how it is that we act with each other. How willing are we to include others in our lives? How willing are we to bring others into our households? Do we separate ourselves from our brothers and sisters at church? Uh, Are we making a place for them at our tables? Are we treating them as our families or just something that we do on Sundays? You see, as adoptees, as Christians, as children of God, we have certain responsibilities. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, it says specifically to imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do, because you are His dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered Himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So if we understand that we're to imitate God because we're his children, this means that we must also adopt as he has adopted us. There's an importance in relationships that we build. We see this exampled for us in David here. We see this exampled for us as Jesus builds a relationship with his disciples. We see this in example as Paul builds a relation with Timothy. We see this together throughout the context of God's Word. If you cannot see that there is an emphasis on relationship and restoring a relationship based on God to its proper position in our life, you are missing a key component of God's Word, as has been revealed to us. Do not make the mistake of separating this community of faith from your everyday life. We should be inviting others into our homes, adopting one another as we have been adopted, giving each other a chance to grow in the right direction and not fall back in the only way that we knew how to survive that is maladaptive and is dangerous for us. Only together can we move forward and build solidly on the foundation that was laid for us. It is imperative that we follow the examples given to us as our new life, as children of God, in our new family, as if it was a family and not relegated to just a small portion of our lives. We must be together. We must not separate ourselves one from another in any way. In Ephesians 2... Verse 19, it says, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of the dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. We're Gentiles. But we are not excluded from the family of God because we are Gentiles. If we are all members, therefore, of God's family, we must act together as a family. This is where our emancipation from what we previously knew comes in. It's that process of understanding what family looks like, but built properly on the foundation of Christ. So if we adopt one another based on our love for God and include others as if they were our sons and daughters, if we give them places at our table, this is the way that we can build each other stronger. Our new family, this is a way to prevent each other from going back to those things that we were emancipated from. Building up, encouraging, being examples We can be like David and take the initiative to seek out those who were our enemies. Are people waiting just for, you know, 
someone to come seek you out? Are you standing by the sidelines waiting for that person to present themselves to you? Or are you actively searching, actively looking to include them as part of your family? Do people walk through the door and you just glance and then continue with those that you're comfortable talking to? Or do you seek out to introduce yourself, to greet them, to include them? David showed mercy to someone who was unworthy, a descendant of his enemy. Do we continue to see people through that lens and see them as beneath us or not worthy of our time? David sought one out who was socially outcast and socially rejected, even despised. Do we discriminate based on one characteristic or another? David was motivated by the love for how uh, the love he had for Jonathan. My question is, how do we demonstrate our love for each other? We continue to make this separation for some reason between our families and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why is there division there? If we are truly adopted into a family, those things should be blended. Those things should be one. There should be no distinction. My household, my family, is your household, your family. Because we were adopted together, and we belong together. Now, we will continue to look at different aspects of adoption over the following two weeks, but today is really just that question of what is that we see in David's example. So today, I just want you to think about and examine your life and how it is that you present yourself before others, how it is that you include others in your life how it is that you imitate God and adopt as he adopted you. So ask yourself these questions. How does David's example speak to you? Now, there's more to the story. I mean, after a couple years, you know, David's son Absalom rises up and, you know, Ziva comes forward, you remember Saul's servant, who was to take care of all the land, comes forward and lies and said that Mephibosheth is throwing his support behind uh, Absalom and trying to overthrow David. But in reality, Mephibosheth mourned for the king's departure. And David comes to see through the deception of Ziva. And David even spares Mephibosheth's life yet again. How does David's example speak to you? My second question is, how have you applied the idea of adoption into your life? I mean, we talked about it a little bit last week, but how have you actually applied this idea of adoption into your life? How is it informed how it is that you interact with one another, you deal with one another. And then I think it's appropriate to take a look at what areas you've separated and made a difference between your church family and your biological family. So what areas have you separated your church family from your biological family? What are those things that you hold sacred and dear and aren't willing to share? I think it's a good opportunity to go ahead and discuss, and when we return next week, we'll talk about further aspects of adoption. Let's pray to close. Father in heaven, as we take opportunity to look into your word and to understand what it means to be adopted, what it means to understand who we are and how it is that we are to live our lives, I just pray that uh, this is not something that just remains kind of a, you know, 
a question for us to ponder, but uh, it becomes something that becomes integral to how it is that we act with one another, uh, how it is that we integrate with one another, uh, how it is that we work together with one another. Um, so Lord, that when what we've built together on the foundation that you have laid through your, jo- your son, Jesus Christ, that we would survive that test, that test of fire. that what we have built together would bring honor and glory to you and how it is that we live our day-to-day lives. Now we pray this in your son's name. Amen.